Yeah, it didn't. I mean, whatever press they got was pretty negative. And but but nobody really went in depth, which for me was very strange on a personal note because I'm from Belgium, and uh, at the time, I was pretty much the maybe not the first. I think there was another guy before me, but at that sort of level, meaning big studio movie that was going to put a lot of money into an animated film and go through that process. I was the only one who'd, who'd ever done that. And when I did on the press tour, when I hit uh, Belgium, I got the same press questions and the same kind of, you know, line of questioning that I got in the U.S., which is like, why are there songs in it? What is this and that? And you're like, wow, here we are. You have a unique window into the behind the scenes, you know, the stuff that happens at the studio when you meet with the studio head and all the executives and all that. And what happened? How did the movie become what it was? And I could tell them because, A, even though there were still Warner Brothers executives with me everywhere I went, it, it was in a language they didn't speak. And I could, I could totally be candid with them. But nobody asked, you know, so it's crazy because there was a much more interesting story behind the making of Quest for Camelot than the movie itself, which I'm very happy you liked the movie. But ultimately, looking in hindsight, it was really a missed opportunity as far as why didn't we do something more innovative or new or, you know, but no, they were just chasing down the old Disney methods from the 80s. You know, it's just it's just weird. And we were very aware of that when we were making it. We just, you know, we weren't in charge ultimately of, you know, when you do broad strokes, when you go, this is the movie that we're going to make, so. Quest for Camelot was Warner Brothers' follow-up to their very successful Space Jam. However, Quest could never quite find its footing and became a box office disaster for Warner Brothers. Here's director Frederick Deschaux the story of the medieval cartoon. Bill Croyer was really the person that should have directed and put that studio, you know, forward, get their movie going. But, but they had, and obviously Bill should speak for himself on this, uh, but I was pretty close in that circle of where things were happening. So from my point of view, uh, and if anybody ever corrects it, that, that's fair enough, but he had a very uneasy relationship with the studio management. Uh, not so much Warner Brothers, because Warner Brothers themselves, uh, as you mentioned about Paramount, really had no clue about making animated movies. And they were just there to facilitate. Whoever, whoever funds Warner Brothers at the time, I don't know if, it, if that was um, AOL yet or whether it was uh, somebody else. But basically from New York, they were told, Here's a couple of hundred million dollars, set up a, a feature animation studio and start pumping out movies. That was the big mandate. And so in Burbank, they were basically like, all right, let's get a bunch of people together. A lot of ex-Disney people. Let's set up a studio and just hire like crazy, give them everything they want. And let's get a director. And Bill was their director. And rightfully so. He'd made a beautiful movie named Fern Gully. And uh, he had all the experience that I said I was lacking. So the atmosphere back then was good. But Bill did not get to do the movie or movies that he wanted to do. And uh, it, it was, you know, when there were big studio meetings, like all hands meetings and all that, you could tell. He had the crew on his side. He was very, uh, very charismatic. Uh, he knew how to get a crew going and riled up and motivated, all the things you need as a director. And he, um, you know, he, I, I think he really wanted to make that Egypt project. I was going to be on it, not as a director. I was, just, I was happy to work on it in development or in story or whatever. It was, it was really cool. But they said no. They tried, you know, as I said, they, they hired Randy Wallace to, uh, to rewrite it and get it the studio away. I don't think Bill liked that. And so basically, it, you know, it wasn't going well between the feature animation management and Bill. It was sort of like, dude, just go with the flow. But he's a real director. You know, he knew what he wanted and that's what he wanted to do. So they ultimately said, nope, you are going to make this movie. And that was Quest for Camelot based on a book they bought the rights to. 
and uh, I think it had a script already at the time. But the studio basically decided for everybody, all the way up, uh, not feature animation studio, just Warner Brothers said, this is what you're going to do. And I remember that decision very well. I, I was very disappointed because I go, what? Another King Arthur story? Are you crazy? There's, Disney's done it already. There's, you know, there's many live action takes. Why? Why not go anything more unique? But they didn't. I, at the time, had just become a director in development at Warner's Feature Animation because I'd sold them two projects. And then one of them, I was attached as a director, and that sort of made me basically you get an office as opposed to being in a cubicle. And you are a director trying to push your project forward. And they really liked what I was doing. They liked my projects. They liked me. Again, in hindsight, probably because I would just do, not that I was a doormat, but I was doing the type of stuff that they liked. They liked what they saw, basically. So when, right before they announced Quest for Camelot, they pulled me off my project that I was developing, and they got me into a room with Bill. We all got along really well. I mean, you know, it was a small crew at the time. And they said, listen, here's this how it's going to go. Bill's going to direct this movie, and you're going to direct it with him we do understand that Bill is the veteran director here. He will, I mean, they didn't use these words, but it was very well understood that he was going to take the lead. Uh, you're going to work alongside Bill because it's an enormous job to direct an animated movie. You know, uh, you're going to follow Bill's lead. Of course, you'll have equal, you know, quote unquote, equal input, but you're going to learn a lot and so on. And I agreed with all of that. I could not believe at the time I go, Okay, so yesterday I thought this is kind of a project I'd rather not be on because I was like, what, another King Arthur story? And then tonight you're calling me into your office to say I'm going to be co-directing with, uh, with Bill Croyer. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Because I was like, I basically was like, oh, so this guy whose work I liked, he was really cool. He was very open, taught everybody. He was a good teacher. He knew his way around the animation industry and he was like okay let's do it i'm gonna learn from this guy i get to walk everywhere he walks and listen in and give my two cents of input you know about this or that and because listen i was opinionated i, I wasn't just like walking along going okay that's cool but i understood where i was at that all made sense to me and so we dove in it, um we had a big party I think there was a party at Bill's house. I think we sang some, uh, they had a band or something. We sang some Rolling Stones, which was very embarrassing for me because I didn't know the lyrics and I can't sing. All was good. We, we had regular dinners together. I mean, life was great. Off we set. And Bill had a vision for it. He hired, listen, we had an overall amazing crew because most of these people on Quest for Camelot went on to do really great stuff. He hired Steve Pilcher from Canada, an amazing production designer. Um, we had Michelle Gagnon. We had, for visual effects, we had all, like, we had top people, top names that all basically came because of Bill. Some great animators. And I don't know how many months in. Again, nobody should quote me on the, uh, on the exact timeline here. But I'm going to say, I don't know, four months in. Maybe we were six, but six at the most, I would say. That uneasiness between uh, the feature animation management and Bill started really just becoming a problem. Uh, not for me, or not anyway, but between Bill having his way of doing a movie, and he was the only one who's ever made a movie over there, like a feature film from a directing point of view. Uh, management, which we can talk about if you, if you want, but they had no clue what they were doing. Feature animation. Warner Brothers at the time was, I mean, it couldn't have gotten any worse. So they, um, they were always head to head. Basically, when you start with the storyboarding and visual development, the movie was divided up in sequences. Bill had half, I had half, and we would sort of guide these through. And then together, we would present them to the upper management. And they would say yes or no, which is already very wrong. If you're going to hire directors to make a movie, let them make the movie. And they weren't. But if you were really good at running a studio, 
that doesn't mean that you are very good at making an animated movie from a creative point of view. Those are two completely different things. But in animation back then, the management set it up that they got to decide everything and everybody else worked for them. And so when we showed these sequences to, to them, they have notes and they go, you know, make them shorter, do this or that. And it was really silly because they would tell Bill, hey, that sequence you just did, it's four minutes too long. And you're like, what? what? Why would you say that? We haven't boarded the whole movie. You've never seen the whole thing together in a reel. Who knows at this point? You shouldn't say a lot of no's. You should let things go unless they cost enormous amounts of money, which they don't early on. Just let things happen. And out of that, there's enough smart people in the room that, you know, we'll figure out how the movie becomes what it becomes. It's, it's, these things take on a life of their own. But they wouldn't do that. They were very eager to impress the studio, the Warner Brothers. And so there came a day. I mean, they did the same thing to me. I was a lot more willing to go, all right, you want four minutes cut out of my thing? I'll cut four minutes out of my Like, I, you know, because I didn't know the road ahead. So I, I was not like Bill, who, said, who basically was always like, well, I've done this before. If it's four minutes too long right now, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll deal with it later. And, you know, he, he knew what he was doing. Our upper management basically one day said, we're going to let Bill go. And for now, you're going to take this over by yourself. And you are, uh, if things go off the rails, we'll find another director to put with you or we'll replace you altogether. And you're like, oh, man. So all of a sudden I was like, okay. So then Bill came to see me. And again, I do not remember the exact words whatsoever. And basically said, dude, we got to stick together here. We're going to walk. We should walk. This upper management doesn't know what they're doing. We need to walk. Ask them, let's walk away. I went into a panic. I mean, dude, I'm in my 20s. I just got a chance to direct. And after four months, you're asking me to walk? What, 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 like, what am I going to do after this? You know, in my head, I was like, if I walk away from this, Warner Brothers, and at the time, there were only five or six studios, is going to go, what is this idiot doing? Walking away from an opportunity like this, he's never going to direct anything in this town again. I had nothing but death. I uh, had personally had just lost everything. I, I, I need to pay off parts of my house and I need health insurance and all, like all this stuff that you need when you're all by yourself in your personal life. I wasn't going to drop the biggest paycheck I'd ever had. I wasn't going to let that all just slip and fall away at all. There was no plan. It was just like, ask them, let's walk away. There was nothing offered in return. So no, that was not a... You know, not a good deal for me at all. They were really shocked when I was like, uh, well, no, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this. And no, I could tell they were really disappointed when I didn't go, yeah, man, you're right. Let's just walk. Ask them. Blah, blah, blah. So that's, we both went our own ways. But it was bad. Bill and I, basically, I don't think we ever talked again. Uh, it was painful it was frustrating it uh but there also wasn't any time to go all right let's let's put the brakes on let's sit down let's talk about all of this on top of that lots of rumors flew that i would have orchestrated his exit and that all of that was one big plan yeah from the 20 year old who didn't know anything about the politics or how to make a movie that i would have orchestrated something you know, that smart. So uh, the upper management totally screwed that entire culture. Upper management over there kept Bill on, which was amazing when you think back at it. Talk about a dumb decision from upper net management. You're going to fire a guy, but you're going to keep giving him his giant paycheck and his wife and have them just kind of come in when they feel like it in the morning and then kind of roam the halls to talk to their friends and undermine the whole situation. Holy cow. They kept paying his salary for him to just hang around. So Bill just vented. And I mean, because he brought most of the crew on. He, it was incredibly destructive, not necessarily from Bill's point of view, because he only did what he should have done. You know, they had treated Bill so badly that he just went around and goes, guys, to the crew, don't work on this movie. This is stupid. It, I mean, 
not the movie, but the upper management, the way they're doing it. They don't know what they're doing. Now, in my head during all of production, did I go, oh, I should have walked away? No. I mean, I've contemplated. I mean, in hindsight, I've gone, maybe. And, and maybe I had enough talent that would, with some more maturity and experience would have come out and the studios would have picked up on it and given me a shot. Who knows? But you know what? The path that I took was the path that I took. And so you can't worry too much about that. You know what I mean? The stuff you do in your 20s. Uh, look, if we are going to look in hindsight, he never did anything again. Meaning that could have been me, but with nothing to show for it. At least he has, he has a legacy. He made good movies. He's got, he had a successful studio. I mean, he's a, he's, he's a guy. He's, got, he's great. He's great in general for the animation industry. I got nothing against him. But I, I mean, I, I caught all the scrap milk, obviously. So I, you know, all of a sudden I was persona non grata as a director. I had no respect. It was just, it was, it was the most, uh, and, and when I say uncomfortable, that is the nicest PC word I can use right now, but it was the worst situation possibly to make a movie in. And so within that horrible culture, this movie was then starting off being made. Journey back to a land filled with mystery and magic. A time of bravery and adventure. Next summer, Warner Brothers Family Entertainment presents Quest for Camelot. So, first of all, upper management had, they had no vision whatsoever. The only vision they had, if Disney did it, when they were whatever, you know, the head of the studio was, um, I'm sure he had bigger titles than what I'm about to say, but he basically ran the splinter division for, was it Roger Rabbit or something at Disney in, uh, in London, and then I think in Florida for a little bit, and then the producer that he bought in, I think, uh, ran the school to train young animators. Like, they, got, they had no clue. Nobody had a clue of how to make a movie or what to do. So they, they had no vision other than, well, when I was a production coordinator at Disney during Aladdin, we did this, which has nothing to do with running a studio or even being creatively involved. I, I don't know how much you know about the animation industry in general at that time, but lots of studios were starting up. Fox had one, DreamWorks just started. And so everybody who was like a, a production assistant at Disney would become a department head at one of these other studios. And whoever was like a production coordinator or even a an associate producer or worked in the office or, you know, watered the flowers at Disney would become president of feature animation. I mean, it was, it was amazing. They just, everybody got, you know, went 10X in, in from one day to the other, as opposed to taking 10 years to learn the job and work your way up. So it's crazy. And as I said, I benefited from that, but, but it re ultimately it hurt the whole studio, I think. Because as I said before, I, you know, I am at heart a real, I'm a creative person. So when I all of a sudden got the thing to myself, and by the way, I don't think Bill would have done this either, <laughs> which is why I liked what he was doing and why I was on board with that. I was like, okay, so we're doing Quest for Camelot. Let's do our own Quest for Camelot. And I asked them to hire uh, European comic book people that I knew some Belgian people, some French people, because I was from that part of the world. So we had the Claire Wendling, Frank Pays. We had some other people uh, also. Let's have them start designing some characters, visual development. Let's make this really unique, meaning go back to what the King Arthur story is. Yes, there was a book, but King Arthur wasn't ultimately not really knights in shining armor. Uh, with lots of flags. It was, you know, the year 400 in early Britain. It was very raw and there was room for creatures and all, you know, there was all this whole world that you could tap into. So we did that for a couple of months and they, they shot that down. They shot that down so badly because it was nothing like they'd ever seen before. One prime example, I still think about those things and I know 
that are at the Warner's archives, those drawings and all that, is that when Frank Pei, who's who's an amazing comic book artist um, from from Belgium, uh, when he came in, uh, I put him on a sequence that was called the troll sequence. And there was a gauntlet that uh, our main characters had to go through, which were these <clears throat> little trolls, very earthy, very sort of rat-like, um, but they had personalities, the whole world. And he developed all of that. And it led into Dragon Country and all that stuff. And ultimately, and it looked so cool. It was so good and so unique and so even tonally earthy and dark, but there was some dark humor in there, all of that. And ultimately, all of that was, you know, he worked on that probably for four or five months, six months. And all of that was just never really, you know, went anywhere. Didn't even get to animation. The dragons did. Really watered down versions of his dragon designs are in the movie. But, but the troll sequence to me was the movie I wanted to make. And I got none of it in it. So obviously speaks to my inability to, to get that done. But, but also that was a big, that was a big shame to me. At one point, I guess, even Bob and Terry, the heads of Warner Brothers, saw what we were doing, and the mandate came down that, well, because, you know, Disney made Sword in the Stone, we should never see the kid, young Arthur, it takes the sword out of the stone. And we were like, what? We're making a King Arthur movie, and you can't see the kid draw the sword out of the stone? Like, are you nuts? No. And so since this came all the way from Bob and Terry, in Quest for Camelot, crazy enough, when the young Arthur actually pulls the sword out of the stone, we cut away to the people that are standing around watching it. It is about the worst movie making you could possibly imagine. You're like literally missing the key moment of that. So, I, yeah. So, <laughs> so. Very crazy, very strange, all of it. So I was told probably probably every other week, called into the office, head studio, if you don't get in line, we're going to fire you. Ugh. So there's this constant bullying and threatening, and that was their style of, of running things. And ultimately, you know, you hang on as long as you can to those original things and designs, but it became, I was surrounded with too many people that they assigned well, these people are going to do layout. These people are going to do colors and backgrounds. And, and before you know it, you basically have an old Disney crew doing something that they weren't comfortable with either. Because again, the movie wasn't set up from a director's point of view, surround he or she with, with the people that they would like to have to do their vision and so on. It was backwards. It was from the top. You know, we just get a bunch of people, tell them what to do hire enough people that worked at Disney and hopefully something good will come out. And so I, and this is where I failed completely. I had no experience in how, how to get, get my vision done. Most people probably didn't even know I had a vision. Most people assumed I didn't have a vision because I literally couldn't get that through. I could not get that going. And I lost on every front. I lost, with making the movie more unique and, and having that feel that I had in my mind, I, I lost, obviously lost at the box office, but lost with upper management and lost with all those artists that I brought in who said, hold on, you make us move our lives from Belgium or from France here for a couple, for four months. And all we are left with is really badly watered down versions of the stuff we gave you. And so those people ended up not really talking to me anymore. So it was it was a big mess and 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 yeah I mean to this day I go as a director you have a a vision you inspire and that vision kind of changes and takes on its own life but it's still really your thing because because that's how it all works I did not manage to do that on Quest for Camelot whatsoever so it became more of getting things done and you know here and there as much as you can because you do get to call certain shots. You go, can we do this? And some stuff in that movie is mine and is what I like doing. But in big, broad strokes, fundamentally, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have done that. 
And one of the things that at that time was also decided was we are going to have songs in this. This is going to be Little Mermaid with swords on horses. It was two things. Not only uh, did the head of the feature studio, feature animation studio, think uh, the safest thing I can do is, is just copy Disney. Therefore, we should have songs, which was funny because at the time, Disney was evolving away from it and going different than the Broadway you know, way of making movies. But the wife of the co-head of Warner Brothers, Carol, Carol Bayer Sager, Oscar-winning super talent in songwriting, and her group of friends were dying to get an opportunity to put, you know, lots of money into a feature animated movie and go get an Oscar. So that aligned the head of Warner Brothers, or the heads, there was two, Bob and Terry. <clears throat> they were aligned with, you know, the head of our studio, feature animation, which I'm sure politically that 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 was a great a great decision so they all wanted songs and we were just told um you know carol and and uh, david foster are going to write you a bunch of songs and let's put those in and it was crazy because that process you know what that process yeah did start kind of late because at the very end the oscar nominated song uh the mother's prayer was delivered and recorded so late that the movie was made and we went back in and reanimated a bunch of stuff to find even a spot for it. I literally, if anything, is one of my claims to fame on that movie is I found a really cool spot to put that song in and juxtapose the mother's prayer against the escape of our main girl uh, away from the bad guys, which I actually thought cinematically worked really well. I'm very proud of that, of that sequence and that moment of doing it that way. Uh, because otherwise, the mother's prayer would not have been in the movie, because it wasn't even intended like that. So, yeah, no, it came it came fairly late, and the movie was never conceived that way. And yeah, and all of a sudden, it was like, oh man, <laughs> this, that is so not what I thought we were going to do. But you know, it was always this thing. So do I just then walk away and go, well, screw it, it's not what I wanted to do, and move on, or do you stick with it? I mean. Uh, listen, we all had mortgages. People were making good money. There was a whole crew we were working. And I, I'm i kind of that blue-collar guy, meaning you get a job, you get that job done. If you don't like your boss, too bad. Head down, get the work done. It is still a huge opportunity. So I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to see this through because I'm going to learn a lot. I, you know, Even if I learn everything of how not to do it, that's still a huge opportunity and way of, of getting a movie done. Getting a movie under my belt is because in Los Angeles, uh, I'm sure it's true today as it was back then. The people that walk around saying I'm a director versus the people that walk around uh, saying I've directed a movie and completed it. Uh, those numbers are, uh, there's lots of them on the first in the first group and very few in the second group. And it's a huge difference, which you only understand when you've gone through it, because everybody wants to direct. And it isn't until you've gone through it that you go, oh, wow. Uh, so it's not really what I thought it is. So I, I always held that up uh, above my head and said, nope, we're we gonna get through this. Um, it did two things that I uh, regret. One is I didn't know how to talk to the crew or deal with people you know, back then. And so all the pressure and bullying and threatening that was done to me from the head of feature animation, all that stress and pressure, I'm sure, turned around and I'm sure I I went that way towards the crew. I didn't think I did that because it wasn't consciously done, like, oh, I'm going to be an asshole. But I've heard, I heard, I think, maybe during or right after that, people went, oh, he was a nightmare to work with or this or that. I'm not quite sure about that. I don't, I don't read gossip or any of that stuff, but enough things came my way that I, first of all, was really surprised at because I thought it was a nice guy, but apparently I wasn't. Maybe that con was confused with the fact that they thought I didn't know what I was doing. In hindsight, having worked with many crews, you know, for 20 years after that, I, uh, I was like, oh, man, 
I really didn't treat the crew or work with people the way I should have. And, and so that's a big regret. That was partially the situation I was in, way over my head, having no help at all and just being inexperienced. So that I really regret. In fact, at 85 years old, Chuck Jones is still a tough act to follow. However, we built on the great tradition of Warner Brothers animation with such recent television series as Batman the Animated Series, Steven Spielberg Presents Animaniacs, and Steven Spielberg Presents Tiny Toon Adventures, all of which have received two or more Emmy Awards for their quality and entertainment value. And now we're continuing to expand our rich history. We made our feature film debut with Space Jam, which was released in 1996 and grossed more than 220 million in movie theaters worldwide. And now we look forward to our first fully animated film to be released May 1998, Quest for Camelot. I was sent to New York to go show the movie to, um, and I might have the name wrong here, but I think it was Jerry Levine who then ran, you know, the bigger uh, Warners uh, or whatever they were called at the time. And he sat through it, you know, but these guys, they, they, they don't know about feature animation either. So they sit, they nod, they go, okay, nice, you know, and, and you move on. And so, no, it never, it, it never, it's funny. It never, there was never a moment where people went, oh my God, this is great. This is awesome. Or where you just feel it in the room. So ultimately, they uh, they saw that the movie just by looking at it wasn't really nothing new. So so I think they kind of just kind of gave up on it and and were in the mode of like, well, how are we not going to lose too much face? I mean, it was really weird. At the very end of production of Quest for Camelot, the head of feature animation actually lent out the crew. Imagine this: the entire crew went to work on Prince of Egypt because Jeffrey was in trouble making his uh, timeline and we weren't done yet. Can you imagine that? Uh, well, you know, uh, so yeah, <laughs> so that's how, how the, the end was very like, huh, what? So that was always tough. And you could tell at the very end, they, they kind of weren't really that interested in me anymore or anything. And it's so funny how they, first they make you do all this stuff and they they go, all right, you got the movie done. And then basically then just, Hew you out and they go, all right, we got the next one. But no, at the end, they all knew. I knew because, you know, I, it was never really what I wanted to do. And, but I thought I did the best I could by, by doing what they wanted to do. But that's not how you make movies. You can't make a movie by just doing what somebody else wants you to do. That would be a giant mistake, which I made. But it's, it's just, you know. So anyway, I was just happy to get through it, to be quite honest. I did 100-hour weeks for almost three years. And by the end, it got so bad that my health, I um, had a sciatic nerve that was pinched. I lost the ability to like lift my left foot. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just, I was a wreck. And the fact that it wasn't on the other side coming together in a movie that I said, yeah, that is really the movie I wanted to make was just super depressing. So the only thing I held on to was well, hopefully there will be another movie for me at some point after that where I can take everything I just learned and do much better during the release of the movie. My girlfriend at the time and I went to Palm Springs and I think I slept for three days and then started the long, slow road to, man, what did I do? Am I still going to be able to work? Should I go back and be a storyboard artist or what am I going to do? And so... And as far as being a pariah in the animation studio, if you're going to piss somebody off, um, it is, um, Bill Croyer is not the person to piss off. Every friend of Bill Croyer, and there's lots of them, meaning that everybody who ever went to CalArts would then go, well, Frederick is an asshole. Don't work with him. Blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, because all those people were very talented and went on to be at, you know, the big people at Pixar and went on to Iron Giant and all. Like they all, so all of a sudden there really wasn't any doors I could go knock on because I, I had gotten a really bad rap and, and only based really on the fact that I didn't choose to walk away when Bill got let go, you know, so they all somehow thought that's what I should have done, which is kind of bizarre because, 
that that whole studio would have probably fallen apart and the studio might have actually closed it down. There was so many opportunities in other newly formed feature animation studios around town that the crew would have left and moved on. So, so yeah, so partially it's good that it got made and it, it held the studio together. You know, there wouldn't, yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? So, and listen, I'm, I'm not asking for any sympathy or pity from anybody, but, um, but yeah, that is, um, that, you know, that's, that's how that was. That's, that's how I got through it. So it was, it was really tough. It, it was, it was, it was very frustrating during the making of Quest for Campbell, but even more frustrating afterwards where you go, oh man, I just didn't have the, uh, experience to make it work for me. I mean, that was, I mean, my fault, but then again, I was, I was in my twenties. So they hired me, you know, what am I going to say? No. <laughs> When you're in your 20s and the head of Warner Brothers says, hey, you're going to do this. And so, so yeah. So I took the opportunity. But, it's, I mean, listen, hindsight is twenty twenty. Ultimately, you go, well, maybe I should have waited another 10 years before I took that assignment on. But you don't think like that when you're in your 20s, you know. Um, you just, you go, oh, you let me do this? I'll do it. <laughs> so, yeah. I, and I can only say it now because at the time I might have not even understood that. But... Making movies is, is basically voodoo. It's black magic. You can you can study all you want. You can have all the taste and all the talents that you want. Ultimately, it's a weird mixture of understanding the situation, understanding the people, how you interact with everybody, how you deal with ideas that come and go. And all. I mean, it is it is just it's a cauldron. It's somewhere between passion and knowledge and just good old-fashioned common sense.